Our day yesterday was kind of taken up unexpectedly by a few trips to first urgent care and then to the ER with this little guy. So just I know so many of you have been praying and asking what actually happened. So you can see he's wearing a little bag on his side and without going into too much horrifying detail. <laughs> it was a rough day, but the, the teams at uh, Phoenix Children's Hospital came to a conclusive diagnosis, and it should be as simple as an outpatient procedure on Tuesday afternoon, and he should be good for life after that. So if you think about it, one o'clock on Tuesday, be praying for that little procedure, but uh, his fever was broken this morning, and he wanted to come to church. And then we were at church, and he wanted to go up and play drums. And so <laughs> he's ready to rock. But uh, I'll send him with mom here so he doesn't spend the rest of service on drums. But thank you guys for, for praying for us. Thank you for, honestly, the last two weeks in our family has been unexpected. And so many of you have offered your condolences and prayers and love and, and food <laughs> And uh, I don't know how many of you have texted me or told me along the way, if there's anything you need, just let us know. And so I just... I just want to say thank you. Thank you for loving us and thank you for being the church. And thank you, Adrian and team, for leading us this morning. What a gift for me just to... already be hoarse from singing at the top of my lungs, but what a powerful time uh, this morning. Um, We are concluding today our series in the book of Romans, and if you've been following along at all in the, in the, the reading challenge, you probably know what this last section is about. And today, we're picking up kind of where Dr. Dan left off last week in beginning with chapter 12, and the first word is, therefore. Now, as you know, if you've been here for any length of time, when we're reading through Scripture and we find a therefore, we have to ask ourselves, what? What's the therefore, therefore? That's right. And so it presumes that something else has already happened. And when we kind of step back and look at the literary design of Romans, we see that it's broken into four distinct sections. And in chapters 1 through 4, we see that the gospel is, the gospel reveals God's righteousness. And in chapters 5 through 8, the gospel creates a new humanity. In chapters 9 through 11, the gospel fulfills God's promise to Israel. In the last few weeks, Dr. Dan has done a great job of walking us through some salvation theology. And then we come to the therefore. It strikes me as like, this is kind of the culmination now. What Paul's about to say after the therefore is almost what's been building up through all of the, the, the challenges, through all of the instruction, through all of the theology so far in this letter leading up to this point. So this is like that point in the movie where everything suddenly start, finally comes together and it's like the big reveal. And what he says is, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And you see, a lot of what Paul had been addressing in the previous chapters was theological debates, right? It was this infighting, it was this quarreling that had come up about all kinds of topics, including who's in, who's out, and it's like we're trying to find what is the best way to worship God. Is it to write, have the, the best theology? And what Paul is saying, your true and proper worship is not ultimately about having the best argument. It's about a life laid down in surrender. And then he says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. I think Paul was looking at the church in Rome and saying, you know what? The world has a lot of division. You kind of expect it there. The world has a lot of infighting. You expect to see it there. But church, you're looking a lot like the world right now. You're conforming to the pattern of this world to be divisive, to be um, divided and fighting. He's like, but the church, we got a better way. And the better way 
is this, to be transformed. Now, transformation is something only God can do, but there's some things that we can do to lay the groundwork for the best conditions, as we say, where God can do what only he can do. It says, be transformed by renewing your mind. There's sometimes we've got to retrain the brain. If you want to talk about it in scientific terms, it's, we're carving new neural pathways in our mind as we, as Philippians 4 would say, we're thinking on things that are good and holy and pleasing, right? And it's through this, through this repetition, it's through this intentional retraining the way that we think that God now has room where he can transform our lives in a, I was going to say magical way, but Let's not be too lucky charms, okay? In a special way that only he can do. (laughs) They are magically delicious, I gotta say. (laughs) Or for all my Aldi fans out there, you know what marshmallow stars are. It's like like lucky charms without the artificial dyes and colors, and they're like $1.20 a box. So it's the best win, win, win. What are we talking about here? (laughs) Then... So you've been wondering, what is the best way to worship? What is the best way to live? And God is saying, it actually begins with surrender. And once you've hit that point and God begins to transform your life, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And if you're an underliner, or circler, or drawer in your Bible, you may want to kind of just circle those verses if they're not already, because that's kind of like the prescription that Paul gives to the church. And then what follows for the rest of the letter is kind of the description of what would it look like? What could it look like? What should it look like if a believer was living their life with God truly on the throne of their heart? And so I'm going to read a fat chunk of scripture here. We're doing all of chapter 12. Um, If you feel comfortable with the person next to you, feel free to cozy up and cuddle in for story time here. Um, But as we read this, if you haven't guessed by now, this fourth section is all about unity in the church, right? Unity in the church. And as we read, listen to how these instructions around the theme of unity are so contrary to the patterns that we see in the world. Verse three, for by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have all the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Wow. Preach that to an individualistic society. You're not your own person. We belong to each other. Verse six, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. And if it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. And if it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Verse nine, Love must be sincere. Sometimes we think we're loving. If we ask someone casually, hey, how's it going? But don't really tell me. I don't really want to know that much. I don't know if I have the time to slow down enough to hear all of the dirt that's actually going on in your life. I just want to seem like I'm interested in your life. But love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love and honor one another above yourselves. That doesn't conform to the pattern of this world, does it? Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. I read a report by Christianity Today a few months ago that said during the pandemic, 26 million Americans stopped reading their Bible on a regular basis. And I'm wondering... If this lack of zeal, if this, if this uh, inability to, to, to be faithful in perseverance, in prayer, I wonder if that's leading to a people feeling divided even more. Verse 13, 
Share with the Lord's people, the, oh, share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality and all the extroverts said, what, what? Verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Are you hanging with me? Verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone, and if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. And then he pivots to a different thought, he says in verse 20, on the contrary. And then he quotes Proverbs 25. It says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Now, at first glance, this could almost look like a continuation of verse 19. If I'm nice to my neighbor, or if I'm nice to my enemies, God's gonna get them, right? It's almost like I do good so that God's gonna get them theirs, right? And it's this kind of vindication almost, but that's not actually what we're seeing when we read this because we're missing some of the historical context. And in ancient times, coal, hot coals were used for a variety of things from cooking as a source of light or heat and sometimes it could be a life or death situation. If you were to wake up in the middle of the night and realize you had run out of hot coals in your stove, like it could be life or death for your family. And imagine in the middle of the night realizing, oh no, and running out of your door, knocking on your neighbor's door and, and bringing them down out of their bed and just saying, I'm so sorry to wake you up, but, but I miscalculated, I forgot, whatever the case is, but me and my family are at your mercy. Could you spare any hot coals for us? And if you're a good neighbor like State Farm, you would say, <laughs> you would say, of course, how many do you need? Two or three should get us through the night. Okay, okay, here you go. And they, since they were burning hot coals, they would put them not in their hands, right? But they would put them on their head in clay pots like they carried everything in those days. And so they would place a few burning coals in their pot and they could bring it home and keep their family warm. Now imagine how desperate your enemy would have to be to come to you in the middle of the night, knocking on your door and just say, I know this is awkward, but I am desperate. We are at your mercy. Could you spare any coals? And the picture here is not, sorry, you made your bed, now you gotta lie in it. The picture here is not even what do you need? I'll give you the bare minimum so you can make it through the night. The picture is extravagant generosity, heaping, burning coals into their pot. That makes the next verse make a lot more sense. In verse 21, do not, overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Abraham Lincoln once asked the question, do I not destroy my enemies when I make them my friends? <laughs> and so for the next four chapters, Paul highlights that there are a lot of differing opinions within the church from politics to taxes to food and all types of personal convictions, but he says all of these things are secondary to what it means to be the unified body of Christ. All right, if you need some comedic relief, it's time to bring out an illustration. <laughs> Behind curtain number one, uh, we got this guy. My dad made this for me when I was wee little, so it's a bona fide antique now. Um, we've passed it on to Wyatt, and you can tell over the years from the braids and the mane and tail and stickers and so on, ice cream spills, that it's been well-loved, well-used, and well-made, right? Because I weigh nearly 100 pounds, and this thing still holds me. <laughs> um, so aside from being built sturdy, my dad was also a gifted artist, you know, I, I think at least. And most of us could probably look at this and identify what type of animal this is supposed to be, right? So let me ask you, what animal is this? People are afraid. This actually is not a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> this is a horse. <laughs> a 
Okay, now comes the trick question. If this is a horse, what is this? <laughs> I heard it. It's a high horse. <laughs> oh no, dad jokes are free today. I'll be handing them out as you leave. Take as many as you want. Um, <laughs> it's corny, but hopefully it's sticky. <laughs> The high horse, the term high horse originated in medieval England, and it referred to horses of large stature, right? They were draft horses, Arabians, that kind of thing. They stood noticeably taller than your average horse. And they were, this made it easy on the battlefield if they were used for war, because you could notify the general or people of certain rank by the horses that they were from far away. They also, over time, became synonymous with um, like power or sovereignty or superiority because kings and emperors would ride these around. And when they came through, when you saw the high horse coming through town, you knew that it was someone important. Over time, as horses became less a part of our daily lives, this term kind of became more synchronous with a person who adopts a superior attitude. And that's where we get the phrase, if you've ever heard it, hey, get off your high horse, right? And I think that's the attitude that Paul is addressing here. As he's talking to these things, he's like, it's okay to have convictions about things. It's okay even to have your own theological interpretations about certain things, but what cannot happen is division, cannot become a point of division that prevents us from working together. And interestingly, in this section on unity, we see something that has become a point of division in the modern church. Um, to set this up, remember that the book of Romans, we call it a book, but it was actually a letter written by the Apostle Paul while he was living or staying in Corinth. He was preaching and leading the church, building capacity and so on in Corinth, but he had heard of these problems arising in Rome, and so he wrote a letter to the church in Rome um, to be delivered. Now, the messenger that would be sent for this, you got to think this is different than, you know, someone running up, dropping a note and saying, here you go, here's the pass off of the baton. Someone, you can read this amongst yourselves and figure it out. No, this was more like... Buddy the Elf reading a Christmas gram, you know, it was presented orally. And so this person that was sent to, to preach this letter, they had to know what they were doing. The person that was sent to preach this letter, they're not only representing the authority of Paul who wrote the words, but they're representing the authority of God who inspired those very words. To set this up even more, this book or, or letter of Romans is considered by many to be one of the most significant books in scripture. And in the early church, they often considered it Paul's primary letter of importance because of the theology that was in it as it encircled around the different churches. In fact, there's many revivals that have even started over the last 2,000 years as a result of study in this book from Augustine to Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation, to even John Wesley, whose heart was strangely warmed as he read Luther's preface to this letter, causing him to begin a movement that has affected millions for Christ in the years since. And so who did Paul entrust to deliver this? He tells us. Romans 16, beginning in verse 1. It says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in, this is basically modern day Corinth, so that you may welcome her in the Lord as is fitting for the saints and help her in whatever she may require for you, for she has been a benefactor of many and of myself as well. Now, as we look at this, Paul uses two key words to describe who Phoebe is. The first one is diakonos or deacon. And Paul only used this for, to, to de describe five people in all of his writings, himself and Phoebe being two of those. And so we have to assume that whatever it meant for Paul to be a deacon in his function in the church from preaching and building leadership and teams, we have to assume that Phoebe was doing the same things. Right. Right. The second word that he uses to describe her is the word prostasis, which is defined here as usually benefactor or helper. But when you look at the original meaning of this Greek word, it translates to a woman set over others. Now, this is interesting, right? And this was the, the feminine word, or the feminine 
um, form of the prostatus, which translates to leader, but in this context specifically, um, it talks about or refers to one who preaches, teaches, and presides at the Lord's table. And so when we read that Phoebe, when we see, where was that? At the end of that verse. For she has been a prostasis of many and of myself as well. She has been a preacher, a leader over many people in our church and over me as well. Isn't that interesting? So you may wonder, okay, why is this divisive? There's, there's some church traditions today that believe in something called complementarianism. Um, and if you're from this background, bear with me for a sec. <laughs> um, I'm not trying to slam. I just want to point out where Paul is coming from here. But in this tradition, and it's popped up really in the mainstream in the last 50 years, so it's kind of a newer thought. But this idea fundamentally starts with this concept that God created male and female with equal value, but with different roles, not with equal roles. And traditionally, that means that the man was created to lead, to rule, um, and that the woman was created as a helper or subordinate to kind of help the man accomplish his vision or calling in life. Interestingly, there's usually a couple verses that were actually written by Paul himself to support this idea, but it's interesting that Paul himself was not a complementarian. He was actually an egalitarian. He believes, along with the order of creation in the beginning, that Adam and Eve were created with equal value and equal role to co-rule over creation. From the beginning, there was no... <laughs> Hierarchy. There was no subordination. That then entered the picture until after the fall, and it was only a result of the fall and what has become in many societies and cultures over the ages, the cultural norm was actually anti the original design of God. And so we see throughout the Old Testament and throughout the New Testament in the words and the teachings and the examples of Jesus and in the words and teachings and examples of Paul it's this constant elevating of women back to their original design. The tragic thing about this is we may see this as a theological difference. Some churches would see this as a theological divide and would actually refuse to join in the mission of God with Renovation Church because we are theologically incompatible. And so institutionally, we see the tragedy. What about personally? What about personally when we begin to look at the difference between difference and division? First, have you noticed how divisive and polarizing the world seems to be? <laughs> no one? No one. Okay, just making sure. And it, in some ways, it seems like over the last few years, it's like ratcheted up another notch, you know? It's like, man, there's people that I used to, there's, well, people that I still know, and it's, I used to think they were pretty normal or average, but man, sometime over the last few years, it almost looks like they've taken a crazy pill, and they've become extremely vocal or outspoken about a particular topic at, to a point that they're almost condemning anyone else that believes differently from them. Pastor Kurt sent me a podcast a few weeks ago um, with Christianity Today's Andy Crouch, and in it he discusses what he believes to be some of the economic, educational, institutional crises that the pandemic ushered in, and then what their long-term effects may be. And he thinks that we may have up to 100 years of effects from the last two years of missed socialization. What has happened in the last few years he says that we are experiencing a social breakdown and the inability of adults to have important or even civil conversations. There's been a global breakdown of trust in fundamental institutions. And he asks the question, is there any neutral ground we can meet on and trust that it will be fair for us all to be in this place? Whether that's a street in Minneapolis or a courtroom or even in a church. 
Because during the pandemic, other people became the enemy. How many remember this first, maybe your first trip to the grocery store? I know for me, first trip to the grocery store, obviously looking for what? Toilet paper. And we're all walking around in there. And this was the first time that I had ever worn a mask into a grocery store. And it was so surreal to see everybody else, their countenance hidden, walking around and trying to figure out the six feet rule. It was all so new. We're like doing dances in the hallways, trying to figure out how to avoid each other. But there was almost this fear that set in. Are you going to infect me? Is someone else going to affect me? And Andy uses this phrase. It's like, it, it almost weaponized humanity. And we began to lose trust in each other. We lost even more trust in our government. And when you lose trust in everyone else and the only person you can trust is yourself, what happens? Some people become experts. <laughs> what I mean by that is how many of us at some point in the last few years did a deep dive on a particular topic, <laughs> right? And it's like, I don't know that I can trust what the mainstream media is telling me anymore. I don't know that I can trust everything the government is telling me anymore. So I'm going to get on YouTube. I'm going to get on my blogs, Reddit, whatever the case is. And we're going to iron this out so I actually know what's going on. The challenge is you finally make up your mind and then you distrust anyone that doesn't share that opinion. And this has ripped our society apart. And so... Back to the friend that you once knew that is suddenly very vocal, outspoken, and no, they don't want to talk about it because they've already made up their mind that you are wrong and not worthy of your time anymore. And I think, wow, and some of these people would consider themselves Christians. And all I can think is looking a lot like the world, church. Wow. Part of me just wants to scream, get off your high horse. <laughs> The problem is, it's easy to point the finger. I hate to think that I'm the one up on the horse. I hate to think that I'm the one who has made up my mind about an opinion to where it's become not only a difference, but a division between me and another person. Masks, vaccines, politics, election recalls, Racism, climate change, abortion, gun control, and so on, and so on, and so on. I watched 28 minutes of YouTube videos. Now I know. <laughs> YouTube wouldn't lie to me. <laughs> Shout out to YouTube. Um, <laughs> So we've read what chapter 12 has to say. It's just a, kind of some cliff notes on what Paul mentions throughout some of the later books here. In chapter 13, he tells us to submit yourselves to governing authorities, taxes, revenue, respect, honor. Love your neighbor as yourself and clothe yourselves with Christ. In chapter 14, we're instructed to accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Did he just say that? That's in chapter 14, verse 22. Maybe, some, maybe you want to underline that one too. But could you imagine how different the church would look if your opinions and views on a topic were kept not between you and your spouse, not between you and your colleagues at work, not between you and your, your internet circle of people, but if it was kept between you and God for the sake of unity. And so the last five chapters in Romans are all about destroying divisions and unifying the church. Is there a horse this morning, a high horse, that we need to get off of? It's hard to be on top of a horse and on an altar at the same time. Wow. 
Therefore, <laughs> I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then, then, then you will be able to test and approve, to discern what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So as the band comes this morning, we're gonna have just a little time of reflection and response, and I wanna ask the question, is there a high horse that I need to step down from? Maybe it involves one of the hot topics I just mentioned, and maybe it's something completely different. Maybe it's feeling a sense of superiority over someone else as we compare our parenting style, lifestyle, hairstyle. Maybe it's judging someone else's judgment. Is that weird? Looking at someone else thinking they're the one on the high horse and saying, you know, I just wish they were more accepting like me. I wish they were more tolerant like me. I just wish they were more inclusive like me. And we're pointing and not realizing that we're the one on the high horse. Maybe it's feeling a sense of superiority over a different theological tradition, as Dr. Dan mentioned last week. This might be mine. Maybe there's someone you need to get coffee with this week or take a walk with in person just to try to remember who they really are. The Bible says our battle is not against flesh and blood, and I think we could take that to mean if, you're, if a person has flesh and blood, <laughs> then they are not your enemy. I don't know where I'm moving this thing. I'm gonna put it over here. And so... It's kind of a weird word this morning, and it's not necessarily the one I wanted to bring, but I feel like it's the one that God had impressed to bring. So if this doesn't apply to you, that's fine. Let's just join in and worship. But this morning, if God has just spoken something to you, these altars are open, and I'd encourage, as the band leads us, would you come? Mm -hmm.